Introduction to the Yi Grid. We will talk about the Yi Grid scheme, and then more importantly, we'll cover consequences of the Yi Grid. The Yi Grid scheme. So this scheme for finite difference approximation of Maxwell's equations was developed by Dr. Kane Yee back in 1966, although he was probably working on it before then. There was some mistakes in that paper that was later corrected, but his 1966 paper is what is the, the famous paper for this Yee grid, which describes how the field components are arranged in a lattice to better approximate Maxwell's equations using finite differences. And we'll get into that. So famous guy. We start with a 3D grid, and I'm showing a grid that's 10 by 10 wide and 15 cells tall. So each one of those little blocks is called a cell. And if we zoom in on one of those cells, we see that it has dimensions along the x-axis, along the y-axis, and along the z-axis. So the size of the cell along each axis, those three things are called the grid resolution parameters. We would like our cells to be as cube as possible, but it is not necessary and not something to be too paranoid about. We have six field components to arrange within each cell. And that's because we have an X, Y, and Z component for the electric field and an X, Y, and Z component for the magnetic field. And the most obvious thing to do if we didn't think anything about this would be to locate all the field components at a common point within each cell. Here I'm drawing it at the origin but really we could put that at the center or any of the other corners. Turns out this doesn't work for many reasons. The better approach is to stagger these field components. And this is one yeast cell and how we stagger them. Notice the X component of the electric field is offset along the, the X axis, the Y component offset along the, the Y axis and the Z component along the Z axis. Now the magnetic fields are done a little bit differently. The X component of the magnetic field is not offset along the X axis, but it's offset along the Y and Z axis. The Y component of the magnetic field is not offset along the Y axis, but it is offset in the Z and X directions. And then last, the Z component of the magnetic field, not offset in the Z direction, but it is definitely offset in the X and Y directions. Now there's some very good reasons that we stagger the field components like this. Initially, it seems like, wow, this is gonna be a little bit more complicated. Conceptually, it might be, but this is a very good thing. It simplifies our equations. And there's also other properties that are very desirable about a staggered grid that the co-located co grid would not have, and we'll get into those. This is a stereo image of the E cell. It's not something I'm gonna talk a whole lot here, but if you print these out onto paper, this will be at about the right size where you can look at this with your eyes. And if you look past this, and each of those two images goes double, and one double from each lies on top of each other, that sort of middle double image, will be three-dimensional. And you can look online for more instructions on how to view these. So here is our Yi cell for a 3D grid. Well, we very often do simulations in two dimensions and maybe even one dimension. So for two dimensions, we have two distinct modes. And what we'll notice if we look at the 3D Yi cell if we look at these top three components, if we look at this plane, that plane, it turns out, is what we will call the E mode. And we call it the E mode because there's one electric field, two magnetic fields, and we'll put everything in terms of just the electric field, so it's the E mode. These bottom three components, we could extract that plane, and this will end up calling the H mode because when we solve this, we'll get a single equation just with all magnetic fields. Even more, we can define a variety of one-dimensional grids, but for isotropic materials, they really all lead to the same solution. So it's only necessary to solve one of those. Now the E and H modes do actually lead to very different solutions. So we, if we wanted to know everything about a two-dimensional grid or two-dimensional simulation, we would have to run both. Why do we want to use the, the Yi grid scheme? First of all, 
notice we're going to formulate everything from the curl equations, and we might ask, but well, what about the divergence equations? If we stagger the field components according to the Y grid scheme, our grid is divergence free. So we have satisfied the divergence equations solely by staggering the field components. That is not true for the co-located grid. And in fact, when I first got into this, I tried the co-located grid. Sometimes it would work. Other times I would see things like 800% reflection and 10% transmission and, and things wouldn't add up. I would change material properties slightly or change something slightly and that reflection and transmission would jump all around. And what I found was that the interface between materials, if the divergence conditions weren't being satisfied, um, was magically getting these surface currents that were adding or subtracting energy from the simulation and things weren't working. But as soon as I staggered the grid, everything worked. The second reason the physical boundary conditions are naturally satisfied. We don't have to go in and build in extra lines of code where there's material interfaces and do a lot of if then kind of stuff. We don't have to worry about that. We can just go one point at a time, enforce Maxwell's equations and that it, and it's all handled sort of automatically by the math of Maxwell's equations. We don't have to do anything else. And the last, it's a very elegant arrangement for approximating the curl equations. And you will see this in the next lecture. But the hint is that if we are calculating the curl of the magnetic field, let's say around an electric field, all the magnetic fields that we need for calculating the curl are immediately adjacent to it. Uh, likewise, if we are sitting at a magnetic field and we need the curl of the electric fields, all the electric fields that we need are sitting adjacently to it. These little faded out uh, vector components, they're from adjacent cells. So very elegant arrangement, as you will see. Here, I'm just trying to visualize larger grids. Uh, here's a two by two by two grid with all the curls circling around, circulating around the other field components. And that's confusing and really hard to see. A little bit easier to see on a two dimensional grid if we're sitting at an electric field here. Yeah, we can see the magnetic fields we need to calculate curl are right adjacent to it. Consequences of the Yi grid. So we do have to pay some prices for the Yi grid and staggering our field components. Here we're looking at an animation of one cell in a, in a larger lattice and we have our six field components and there's a wave passing by. Notice certain field components are in different parts of that wave. Those field components are out of phase. So even though they are XYZ components of the same electric or magnetic field, since they're in physically different positions, they're out of phase. So anytime we want to inject a wave into a Y grid, extract a wave, analyze a wave, we have to take this into account or problems and inaccuracies will arise. Similarly, if we have some kind of material and let's say it slices through the middle of a Yi cell, that can actually place some components inside one medium and other components in another. So even though they're all the components of a one single vector quantity and they're all within a single Yi cell, just the fact that we might have some curved surface can actually place some in one material and some in another. So to handle this, we actually assign each field component its own array for either permittivity or permeability. And for the most part, these arrays will look the same. It's just at the boundaries of curved objects where some field components might be inside, some might be outside, that those differ. And so that's a way that that is handled. And we also use that a bit when we incorporate things like our PML. Another thing that could happen, and this this not isn't this isn't necessarily the fault of the Y grid. Any any grid would do this, but a uh, a numerical wave traveling across a numerical grid will actually propagate slower than the physical wave would. So let's just start discussing this. So a physical wave in a physical medium it follows a dispersion relation, and it looks something like this, where we have frequency, we have the speed of light. We have the material properties, and then we have the magnitude of the wave vector squared over here. So that's the dispersion relation. This is derived by substituting the expression for a plane wave into the wave equation. 
turning our algebra crank and out comes this rule that basically says the wave, the, the magnitude of the wave vector is fixed and is constant for all directions. And of course, if we went into anisotropic media or other kinds of media, that wouldn't necessarily be true, but that's the equation for an isotropic medium. Now, if we take the expression for a plane wave on a Y grid, so it's a numerical wave on a numerical grid, we can do the same thing. We have a numerical wave equation, plug that wave expression for a wave in that, turn our algebra crank, and out comes a dispersion relation on our Y grid. And it has some similarities. The expression on the right-hand side is the equivalent of the magnitude of our wave vector, but things are a little bit different now due to the dispersion of the grid. Also on the left, we have this velocity term. Now, one person might wanna write the speed of light there, but since we know that this is traveling slower than a physical wave would, this isn't actually the speed of light, it's something slightly smaller. So I'm writing it as V, knowing that that is a little bit different. We certainly would like these to be the same, but they are not. It's slightly slower on a Yi grid. Now, if we have a structured grid, this is our normal Yi grid, a, uh, and we look at the refractive index as a function of direction. If we have a physical wave in air, let's say, um, this is going to be the dispersion curve, if you will. It's the a plot of refractive index as a function of direction, and it's the same in all directions. But in our Yi grid, we not only see that this refractive index is different than the physical wave, it's a little bit higher, making the wave travel a little bit slower, but it's anisotropic. This, it's different for different directions. And we actually see that it's worse along the Cartesian directions than it is along the diagonal. The dispersion is actually the least along the diagonal. So we get anisotropic dispersion from our structured grid. So how can we compensate for this? So we can come up with something that we call a compensation factor. Let's go back to the dispersion relation for our, our Y grid, and we solve this for that velocity term. This is the thing that we would like to be equal to the speed of light, but it's different. In fact, the actual velocity, our numerical velocity on the Y grid is the speed of light divided by this factor. So we can kind of think of this as the refractive index of the dispersion on our grid. So it's the factor by which the, the wave slows down relative to the speed of light. So from this, we can combine these two equations, take this expression for V and plug it in here, solve for gamma. And we have an equation now for calculating this compensation factor. We're calling it a compensation factor because we can use this to compensate for the numerical dispersion. So that's how we calculate it. And this will become a number something like 1.01 or 1.001, just slightly larger than one, meaning we'll end up with a velocity just slightly smaller than the speed of light. Writing this slightly differently, we used to have an omega um, square root of mu times epsilon. I'm writing this now as a K naught times N. And I think this is a little bit more closer to how it's used in practice. And so refractive index, we will take the maybe the average refractive index across the grid and calculate our compensation factor. Okay, so how do we actually compensate? Well, we will set up our grid, get ready to simulate. And right before we're ready to simulate, what we'll do is we will look at our permeability and divide by this compensation factor. We will look at our permittivity and divide by the compensation factor. And we will come out with new relative permeability and relative permittivity. And we actually use these on the grid. So we lower the permeability and permittivity across the entire grid that artificially speeds up the wave. And if we've calculated this compensation factor correctly, then we artificially speed up the wave to just the right amount that it travels exactly at the speed of light across our Yi grid. Now let's think about this technique because there are some subtleties to this and things we have to think about. We have to pick a direction, right? We are calculating our compensation factor for the speed in a particular direction and we know that that changes. So depending what direction we pick, we calculate a different compensation factor. So this tells us we can actually only compensate 
in a single direction. Further, we have to pick a single value of mu and epsilon from which to calculate that compensation factor. So we can only compensate for dispersion for one choice of the permeability and permittivity. So maybe you choose an average, or maybe if the entire grid is filled mostly with air and you have one little dielectric object, you would just use the mu and epsilon for air. As far as direction goes, if your wave, you know, has a very dominant direction, it's probably best to pick that. If you know nothing else, um, I look at two extremes here. I see one, a, a minimum compensation factor along this direction, a maximum along this direction, and somewhere in between at an angle of 22.5 degrees, you'd probably get some kind of number in between. So I tend to pick this direction, calculate the compensation factor, and then eliminate dispersion if I don't know anything about a dominant direction for my waves. So we calculate the compensation factor and then lower the relative permittive, permittivity and relative permeability according to that fudge factor or compensation factor, and we've compensated for the dispersion. And this works very well.